Welcome to Cowtown Museum, our winter lecture <laughs> series. Today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about bicycles. Now, they say you should probably talk on what you know because it's easier that way. Well, I thought I knew a lot about bicycles, and I thought I knew a lot about women. Lord have mercy, did I learn a lot? So, uh, surprisingly enough, the uh, it's been like whenever you pull a string on a sweater and you just kind of keep getting a little more and a little more and a little more and a little more and a little more. And a little more. So it just keeps going on and on. So I've had a lot of fun learning. I hope that I'm communicating it well. Uh, those in the back, are you in the middle We've got a little bit of feedback. Okay. Okay. Well, bicycles. Yes, 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 yes. History is all about change and how we adapt to change. And believe it or not, in our time here, there was one piece of technology that had profound implications on our world that went on way, 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 way past the time period. And for us today, that's going to be nice. Now, Susan B. Anthony said in 1868, the fashion worshiping, theater going women and the ladies easily overcome all the delicate scruples about the manner of riding and soon conduct the whole sex into what will become graceful and helpful and useful exercise. Wow, such <laughs> radical words from a radical woman. So. She also said something amazing. She said that she was in, in favor of people riding. Women riding the stride. Now, if you're not sure what that means, it basically means whenever you get on a horse on a saddle, you are riding. Okay. In our time period, most things that ladies did because of the dresses were side saddle. So, and then her most famous quote that is quoted over and over and over and over and over and over again. I think bicycling has done more to, to emancipate women than anything else in the world. And in many ways, she was right. We'll try to explore that. Hopefully, by the time we're done, you will believe that that is true. Mm -hmm. On April 15, 1815, a giant eruption occurred, followed by thunderous detonations heard round the world, some as far as 800 miles away. On the morning of April the 6th, volcanic ash began to flow within 800 miles and the faint sounds of detonation continued. What was first thought was the sound of firing guns about 1,600 miles away turned out to be the sound of more and more eruptions. On April 10th, we have pumice stones falling from the sky, eight inches and more falling over 800 miles away. On April 11, a veil of ash covered the whole area. This went on for the next, well, four months or four years, the effects. So, what in the world was going on? We had the largest volcanic eruption that has ever happened in recorded history. And it did something that was really, really, really amazing. It basically changed our climate. 1816 was a year without winter because, because, the volcanic ash was covering the sky and covering the sun. Things didn't grow. Temperatures went down. And it's utterly amazing. I like this little blue section right here. That is probably the one that's the hardest to raise. But what I couldn't find, and wish I could find, was a map that showed the US. Uh, the northeastern part of the United States, from about Massachusetts on up, would have been about that same color of blue. Fields and crops died. Horses died by the hundreds and thousands because there was no food for them. The eruption had a had a about three year time where it was slowly building and things were not going well. Farmers were not doing well. Um, this right here is the Thames River. The Thames River in England froze over for the first time in recorded history, and people are ice skating. 18 inches of snow in June in Waterbury, Vermont. 
On July 4th, they had snow. All of their fireworks were, were snowed out. What in the world is going on? In the world without summer for that 1816, there was a gentleman by the name of Baron Carl von Grace, and he developed one of the first practical usable bicycles. Now, if you know any history about bicycles, Leonardo da Vinci is said to have sketched one out. Um, folks over in China have one that possibly was sketched out. I'm not even sure whether it actually went into practice. The Italians have a couple. But as far as selling something that was usable and well used, uh, Mr. Drace was the first one. Now, one of the challenges I had in researching is that he's German, so the Ross machine, but whenever he had transported it to England, it was called the Gazine, and whenever he transported it to French, it was again the Gazine. Whenever I was researching, I thought, oh my gosh, there's three different vehicles happen to speed. So it took a long time for me to figure out. So this turns out to be one of the first bicycle crazes that sweeps the whole world. Well, I should say Europe and, and the United States. Um, they import this bicycle over to the United States. And for a while, it's used. Now, the, the funny thing about it is that it's basically something that you straddle. You can move the handlebars, but you basically push it with your feet and you go, which is very, very, very interesting. Now, um, on one of the time trials, one of the races that it was involved in, it went up to eight miles an hour. Not a bad deal. Now, the reason why it was so important for the Baron to have this device was that he was in charge of Her Majesty's royal forest. And so he had to go and inspect the forest and make sure everything was fine. But there were no horses because they, a lot of them had died because of the drought or because of the, the uh, volcanic ash. And so he, <coughs> being a tinker, decided that he would create something that was more effective. And it seemed to have worked very, very well for him. The only problem is brakes, eh, not so much. Well, we've got good heels. That's, that's a bit of a problem. So now we do consider the ladies. Here we do have uh, a basket attached to the front so that he can, he can uh, guide one of the ladies around. And so that was one, one uh, accommodation. Now, in our time, actually any time, people who have ideas, their ideas are cobbled upon and modified and changed and that sort of thing. This may be kind of too tiresome. Oh, I'll see the In 1819, a coachmaker by the name of Dennis Johnson took his design and said, I'm going to make a better one. Instead of wood, he created a metal piece. And he kept pretty much everything else the same, except for where wood was involved, he put in the metal and used that instead. He also made an accommodation for the ladies. He thought that it was very, very, very important that ladies experience the same type of thing that he was providing for the gentlemen. Now, you'll notice what kind of clothes the ladies are wearing. Uh, with a little drop right here, ladies can continue following the fashions of the time and everything as well. This has a this will change in just a little bit. In 1839, it is rumored that there is a gentleman in Scotland that created a new type of bicycle. He took the two-wheel, he took the two-wheel arrangement, but he created pedals that go with it, and these pedals go to a rod, which go to a rod here that's going to drive the shaft. And so it kind of has this kind of motion going on and on and on and on and on. Now, it, it never caught on, but there are so many scholars that are skeptical that it even existed. Um, his great grandson, I believe, was one of the proponents of it. And he was one of the ones that created the model. And so some people are not even sure that it actually, actually existed. Although, there was one report in the newspaper of, of a, a crash. A gentleman on a strange vehicle ran into a lady and he was fine. I think it was five shillings or something like that. And so that's one of the things that they say, well, see, it actually existed. Well, okay, we'll have to see that. But anyways, the idea is that once you put 
an idea out there. People are going to work with it, modify it, change it, or move it to their own types of thing. Now, there was a gentleman by the name of Willard Sawyer in Dover, England, and he decided enough with his balancing type of thing. Let's give people a more stable type of a vehicle, and let's go ahead and incorporate uh, the power to it as well. So it's kind of hard to see. But here we have, this is the shaft between the two large wheels, and we've got a pedal here and a pedal here. And so as you are pushing forward and pushing forward and pushing forward and pushing forward, it's, it's making it make it go away. Um, from the, the end of the Dross machine until about the 1850s, there was lots and lots and lots of exploration in four-wheel and three-wheel vehicles. Unfortunately, not a whole lot of photographic uh, evidence exists because the cameras were not widely in use if they were even invented at the time. But this was his attempt. Uh, he did something that was very, very interesting. He exhibited his machine at the Prince Albert uh, Pro Progressive uh, Industry exhibit that he had in London. And his feature was a mortise on the prince. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Now you gotta remember, England was a superpower back in that time. And so whatever happens in England is probably gonna happen around the world. And so in the 1850s and, and early 60s, he was sending this vehicle all over the world. Now, just to give you a sense, uh, what he makes for the prince is not a simple everyday vehicle. Notice the night nice scroll work and, and the like, but it's still basically the, basically the same. Um, one thing that we have over and over again, even brakes. People figured out real easy how to get people going, but how to get them to stop is a little bit more challenging. Uh, the other thing was that he was quite pleased that this also was something that would apply to women as well. So, very, very good so far. Now, in 1863, we have a new device come on, on the machine called the Velocipede or the Bone Shaker. Now, Velocipedes apparently is more of a category, and so a lot of vehicles from this time on, and actually the grace machine is sometimes called a velocity as well. And so that's where things got a little bit confusing in the research. Anyways, but you'll notice that the pedals are directly applied to the front wheel. That's a novel idea, so now you don't have to pick it with your toes. Um, they do in install a small brake on the back which is probably a helpful thing. There was a French father and son team that were in the business of doing this, created 400 bicycles a year. Now remember, this is all homemade stuff, okay? This is not factory stuff. And so these guys must have been really, really working crazy time. In 1867, in the Paris exhibition, all of a sudden it becomes very well known and very, very popular. It starts a craze to things until the early 1870s. There we go. Now, just to give you an idea of how much fun this vehicle was to ride, let me see if this is, oh, come on. Ah, let's go backwards. Ah, there we go. Now, there's no sound for about the first 30 seconds or so. Except for that sound. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Well, that's ridiculous. Let's see if I can get it to start again. Yeah, there we go. Okay.
Oh, good grief. I'm so sorry. <coughs> How far along was it? See if I can move it along. It's starting to re it. Okay. Let's see. I can't reach the slider. Okay. Well, if I keep this out of my hand, we should be all right. <laughs> Now the one question that I had, the one question that I had that this video kind of answers is how in the world are you going to get off this thing? And how are you going to start it? And so that is one of the nice things that it shows. What's that? It's on pause. All right. Well, shoot. <clears throat> Will you let me go forward? Okay. Well, what I was hoping to show you is number one, because because the wheel the pedal is attached to the steering wheel. Every time you step on the wheel, it's going to make the steering wheel go one way or the other. And so it's a very challenging thing to drive in a straight. The other thing is, um, it is low enough to the ground that to get on it, you straddle it, and then you lift one foot, and you put it on, and then you pedal away. Now, is this going to be a problem for ladies, do you think? Ladies in dresses? I think this is going to be a real bit of a problem. So that was one of the challenges. Now, this thing was so popular, it went off like gangbusters. Um, we have all sorts of schools and rinks and uh, races that happen. The idea of personal transportation plus the, uh, the racing that went along with it was just, just utterly phenomenal. And so there's a couple of, of graphics of that. Um, the graphic should show you a little bit why people didn't think it was that easy to uh, figure out how to write. Now, as I said, there were innovations. As soon as you put an idea out there, there are all sorts of innovations. This is my favorite one. The American Clipper unicycle. How would you like to have a wheel go round and round and round your head? I don't know if I'm going to do that. Here we have one that goes on the ice. We have ice skates on either side. We've got palm nail tires. Here we have someone that's, we've got a shaft to a to a paddle, and so you can paddle the ladies around. We also have steam power being applied. For those steam pump people, I've got another slide coming up that may be intriguing. Here you go. 1867, we have a steam powered velocity. Holy cow. I don't know if I'd like to be riding with this thing coming out the middle of my back. Um, he continued to work on it. Uh, 1896, he was demonstrating another version. And I couldn't quite tell from the biography whether or not it actually blew up or he had turned it off in time or just what exactly, but it didn't end out well because that was the end of his life. So, so innovation, innovation, innovation. Now, here in Kansas, because it started on the coast and comes our direction, it takes a little bit longer. Um, it's pretty much the same experience as what happens back on the East Coast. We have lots and lots and lots of people that are interested. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It's kind of like the railroad. The railroad is coming, the railroad. Velocipedes are coming, velocipedes are coming. And they do, they eventually get here. Um, people are amazed at the speed, personal transportation, messengers delivering general transport. The thing that I find most interesting is one of the reasons why this vehicle fails to catch on and why the craze dies is trying to find a flat surface to ride on. Why didn't it catch on here in Kansas? It should have kept going and going and going. But we have now opened the door of what could be possible. And that'll set the stage for future, future events. Now, now 
The advent of the bicycle stimulated a great controversy about the woman's proper role in the world. Because ladies, as soon as this new technology arrived, they wanted to be a part of it. They wanted to jump on it and join it as well. Many critics of the bicycle and riding threatened, said that it threatened women's health, morals, and reputation. And it, as it facilitated an unprecedented degree of individual mobility and independence. Oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> Questions of if you should ride, how you should ride, where you should ride, and who you should ride with were constantly debated over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Now, right before the philosophy came to Kansas and the United States, we had a race in France that demonstrated the fears that many people were concerned about. Now, take a look at that picture and then Harper's Weekly. They drew illustrations of it as well, but what did they do? They put undergarments on the ladies' legs. Because in our time period, proper ladies would never ever show their legs. And so, had they shown the previous slide, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah is coming, is coming. In the popular press, this is what the critics were fearful of. What do you think, ladies? <laughs> My goodness, give ladies a little bit of freedom and you're gonna open wide, it's gonna go crazy, so. 1827, and this is the popular attitude. What are women intended for in civilized society? To enchant mankind by feminine loveliness of person, grace society by the gentleness of her mind, contrast with the rougher sex of her own, far more exquisite fineness of spirit and divine sensibility of the souls, the angels in disposition as in form, and so beautifully discharge all those duties which humanity assigns them as the fountains and nutrices and consolers of the race, that it might seem rather beings be adored than mere equals and companions of men. How do you think that, not mere equals? Hmm. <laughs> to the gentle and proper exercise of youthful females in school, we have no objection, but when you teach grown women, wives, mothers, and aunt to, and grandmothers to handle a pipe, jump over a dinner table, how is it possible that gymnastical education would be good? For our parts, we would rather have their muscular powers be never brought into full action. <laughs> they are so delightful as they are that we would not for all the world run any risk of spoiling them or altering them. <laughs> Don't you ladies feel good? <laughs> now, the woman question is something that has plagued our time period. And really, because there is so much change going on, um, it's always been a part of human history, but in our era, uh, there are lots of people raising questions about it. And so we have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of conversation, or I should say dialogue in the newspaper. Um, women were seen as a product of their biology. Their natural state was to be nurturing, passive, emotional, spiritual, frail, and even sickly. Oh my goodness. A whole woman's being was, was seen to be controlled by her reproductive system. All mental and physical disease could be ascribed either directly to disorders of the reproduction or pathological changes in other parts of the body. Oh my. Physicians claim because they had knowledge that and, and authority that what they say was true. And so they put out lots and lots and lots of treatises that were that were not um, challenged because they were the official people. They believed that there was a force in the body, a limited amount of force. Sounds a little bit like some Chinese philosophy to a degree. But women, by studying and acting physically, they were going to be evacuating some of that force. And so we need to make sure that we protect ladies from overexertion and sweat. Oh, well, some, some people might agree with that. I don't know, but the over the sweat part. So. <laughs> Caution, uh, exercise is necessary for the constitution of women is adapted only to moderate exercise. And the graces cannot be reconciled with fatigue and sunburning. Over and over and over, you will find medical treatises talking about fatigue. We do not want ladies to get fatigued. Fatigue is the worst thing that could happen to a lady. 
over and over and over again. <laughs> so, whoops. Pain should be taken to guard against catching cold after exercise. And this seems sort of, sort of um, natural and good information. Uh, prevailing attitudes, though, were slowly being, being changed. Uh, the Industrial Revolution moved people out of the fields, the factories. Life became a lot more sanitary, especially for the middle and upper classes. And they found that had all sorts of diseases, and one described degenerative influences of luxury. Well, there you go. Doctors argued that middle and upper class women were the most delicate and sickly, and non fatal female complaints were especially common. Late hours of luxurious living, bad air, and the wanted exercise had made them mere effigies of women. But class. Servants, factory workers, and poor women did not, did not seem to have a need for a week of rest during months, and they got plenty of exercise from their work. Hmm, what's going on there? So health reformers in the 1800s believed that the basic belief that better diet, fresh air, exercise, education about physiology would be good for all men and women. I noticed there's a statement about Restrictive clothing. Uh oh. Uh oh. So, how much exercise should a girl engage in? Well, whenever girls are young, they should run and jump and do whatever they feel like doing, along as long as they are engaged in their fatigue. Don't get fatigued. But <sighs> girls from the earliest, they have to be encouraged to activity because girls would rather sit in the garden and talk with their friends. And, you know, they're not really active people like boys are. Regular exercise is essential in young women because of the later life is going to be even more sedentary. Oh my goodness. Past puberty females had to be careful not to over exercise. Injury doesn't result from sudden over exertion, but the daily repetition permanently impact, impacts. So there you go, there you go. Now, what exercises are appropriate? Well, any game that, they, that boys can play whenever they're young, as long as they're not athletic, because those are required for boys. Hmm, that's interesting. Drundle and hoop, which we have our girls do out here a lot. Exercising the bones, the legs, the muscles of the body, that's great, but, Girls past the age of 12, exercises were generally not advised. You need to slow down. So. Activities that were, prop were smiled upon, calisthenic, dancing, horseback riding, and walking. Now, calisthenics, believe it or not, were the first major trend back in the 1830s. They were German in origin, and they were imported. It was quite a fad up until the 1860s and early 70s. They were really, really, really something that ladies were supposed to do. Um, they even have um, exercise equipment, some that looks like a total gym, if you've seen those infomercials. I wanted to put a, a picture of that, but I didn't get there. So anyways, their, their choreography represents the dance steps of the time. But remember, any changes in the body brought on by physical training were not intended to minimize the difference between men and women, but to fuller enable the maternal role that the delicacy facilitated. All right. <coughs> so if you're going to take care of those vulnerable parts of society, the men, the old women, and all of the people that need assistance, you need to have your own strength, but it is within reason. Dancing, there you go. Dancing is the best <laughs> adapted for women and when it's discreetly employed is highly conducive to health, except that the movements are largely confined to the feet and to the legs. So not exactly the best exercise, but it's, it's one of the favorites. So, but you gotta watch out. Girls are likely to carry it to excess. Once girls start dancing, they're not going to stop. And then we have the dreaded fatigue that may show up. So whenever you have these violent dances, like reels and waltzes and shuttishes, you probably need to sit back 
Now, horseback riding. Horseback riding is the most energizing exercise that women can do. But you need to be careful. Whenever the young girls are, are out riding, they need to make sure that they keep a proper posture straight up and down because you don't want to slouch and that sort of a thing. So if riding can be recommended on account of health, girls should be taught to ride both sides of the horse to present the twisting of the body. Now, everyone know, knows what that means, right? With dresses in our time period, ladies did not ride astride. They rode side saddle. And if you've ever seen a lady, lady riding a side saddle, it's a bit of a contortion activity. So make sure that if they go down the field in one direction, they're coming back and switch sides and go down the other way. Now, we haven't talked about how we get girls and ladies up on top of those horse side saddles, and that's another thing in itself. So, by far, walking is the best exercise that men and women can do. You can do it anytime, anywhere, and that is what we should do. Victorians believe that fresh air was necessary for health because it got rid of the toxins. Smoke from indoor gas lamps, cigarettes, fumes, industrial machines, poor ventilation. There you go. More and more free time should be set outdoors, which is such an amazing thing that they discovered. It is amazing how different in this country, the United States, it is considered a matter of delicacy for a woman to keep herself immured at home, and she pays for it for a slender constitution, pallid cheek, and the early decay of her teeth, premature loss of all beauty which health can bestow. Now, this is a revolutionary idea. This came from a, from a health reform tract, and so it's, it's uh, okay, really radical stuff here. By late 1800s, forms of exercise is going to include tennis and bicycling. And it was the bicycling that caused the problem. Oh my goodness. Before that, ladies are re relied upon men to provide horses, saddling, as well as harnessing for the carriages and the like. And so it, it is something, this degree of freedom and independence is just a really, really, really scary thing. Threaten women's health, morals, and reputation. Where did they go? Where did they go? The debate about morality and bicycles center around the morality of the middle class women sheltered as home as their nature dictated. They had no natural ability to stand up against the vulgarities of the world. They lacked the moral resolve and character of the upper classes and could be easily swayed and impressed by the immoral actions of others. See, I find it so interesting. We have the upper class. The ladies are very, very determined and and they're very resolute. And if you talk about the ladies in the lower class, they're the same. But it's this growing people group of middle class that we've never had before that are suspect. And I find that very, very, very fascinating. Based on previous knowledge, the kind of women who deliberately made themselves conspicuous in public, prostitutes, the assumption was that cycling was far from respectable. Not exactly prostitutes, perhaps, but possibility limit of, of loose morals with an underdeveloped sense of propriety. See, you let women go free and they're just gonna go crazy. So what are you gonna wear? Oh my goodness, because you're gonna be more active. Ah, critics uh, against union suits, they really didn't like the bloomers. Uh, shorter skirts in, invited insults and advances. What in the world are we going to do? So the combination of heavy skirts, constricting courses, greatly restricted women's mobility. The corset, and that's something I'll put, again, the threads of pulling the little parts of the speech out. Um, in two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, I'm going to be talking about the dress reform movement, and we'll talk more in length about that, plus corsetry as well. But in our era, <coughs> for the Victorian lady, a corset was a badge of honor. It was a badge of what you should well at wear, and those that did not wear one were considered loose and morally suspect. Oh, <coughs> my goodness. 
So here we have dress reform, just to give you a little bit of a teaser. Uh, 1851 is kind of their, their invention. Uh, they're based on the Turkish uh, pants that uh, a diplomat, a British diplomat saw the ladies wearing and thought it would be a grand idea if ladies in our, our country can wear as well. Uh, surprisingly enough, uh, bloomers are not necessarily first invented by Amanda, but she gives her name to them. But she herself, by 1859, is no longer wearing because of the social pressure and the, the things that are happening because they're just too outrageous. So here are some of the accommodations that we've made for women so far, as far as bicycling are concerned. Uh, here we have the velocipede. There was a model that had a dropped center bar, and so ladies could go ahead and do some riding. Here's another version where this is a side saddle version. The two pedals are on both sides. Now, I wish I would have, would have had that video. If you could have seen it whenever you push with one. It really jerks the whole thing around. Imagine the kind of arm strength you have to have in order whenever you push pushing with both feet that you're going to try and keep that thing going forward. That's just nuts. Um, here we have a, another version with them. Here we even have a bar that goes across so the lady can ride side saddle. There's another version of the lady riding the side saddle. So you get the idea, right? Ladies are attempting to use what they normally use and adapt, or at least we're creating equipment that let them use what we normally use. The idea of changing is not really in the works. So, the bone shaker craze was a craze that quickly outplayed itself. The cycles were heavy and cumbersome. Remember, they were all metal and cast. We haven't started using tubular steel yet. Um, there was no suspension anywhere. Every bump that you hit came all the way up your backside and it really hurt. Um, riding velocity took a great deal of strength and coordination. Steering was a challenge, but the most challenging thing, several people said that this vehicle probably could have existed even longer had we had smooth riding services. Over and over and over, you see lots and lots of towns and cities that are putting ordinances against riding on the sidewalks. And why are they riding on the sidewalks? Because in Europe, we have cobblestone streets. And if you've ever walked on a cobblestone street, it's not smooth, but the sidewalks are smooth. So, here in the United States, um, the big, bigger challenge uh, was the patent rights. Um, the inventor of the, of the, the Velocipede um, sold his patent rights to one particular gentleman who disputed the sale. And so lots and lots of, of back and forth as to whether or not someone actually had the patent rights. And so if you don't have patent rights, you're going to start a, a factory to build them. Probably not. And so that pretty much died. So. Now, from 18, 18, well, over in England, over in England and France, we've had an interesting dimension. I heard some people talking about the, the bicycle up front. Um, the faster that you can go with the velocity, the smoother your ride is going to be and the farther the distance you can go. And so people started experimenting. And notice what happens. That front wheel gets larger and larger and larger so that you can go faster. The only problem is this taller you get, the more stability that you really, really don't have. Now, one of the challenges also is that they had something called a spoon bill brake. I wouldn't bother wasting my time with it because it really isn't that much of a help. Um, whenever you're going downhill, I can only find a modern picture of it. What's this guy doing? Coasting. He's coasting, and where is his legs? Remember, the uh, the wheels are not the wheels are going to constantly turn. You can't just let them coast. And so, whenever you're going down a hill, you put your legs on top of the handlebars. And uh, one of the people commonly suggested that if you were going to wreck. That way you're already halfway toward the ground and you can continue running as your vehicle is going down. So that sounds a real vote of confidence, I do believe so. In 1871, Starley created the aerial. Um, now there's a bit of a controversy. Um, 
Eugene Meyer is the one that supposedly uh, is now recognized as the one that created the spoked wheels. Up until this time, the Velocity basically used carriage wheels, and it's basically a single shaft. We're now putting V-shaped, V-shaped spokes in our wheels, and that's going to help them. them uh, it'll let them, whenever you hit a bump, it'll react a little bit softer than whenever you hit it with a, with a um, solid bike. So uh, they were called the penny farthing. I thought that was kind of a common term. Uh, several people said that it was a very dis disparaging word, which, sorry, but the penny for the English and the farthing, so that's how he gets his word. So, um, but Ariel, whereas they say that Meyer was the founder and creator of it, uh, Starley was the one who really promoted it. He basically becomes the father of the English uh, bicycle trade. So, but again, this innovation of a larger wheel means smoother and faster, but not necessarily safer. And on the bottom, just like with a velocity, you're pedaling on your same steering wheel again. And so the faster you go, it's going to help, but every time you push, it's going to jerk the wheel back and forth just a little bit. So the faster you go, the less jerk you're going to see. So is this going to be a bicycle made for everybody? No, no, no. <laughs> for the young man and those who had money is, is the idea. In 1877, Colonel Pope, former military officer during the Civil War, uh, he was a, originally he was a manufacturer of many things, including sewing machines. Surprisingly enough, sewing machine makers and bicycle people are often hand in hand. In hand so, but he, Imported some, and then he started to make his own. Hundred dollars for a bicycle. What do you think? Uh, dollar a day? Yeah, I don't think I don't think my people are going to be able to to have one of those. So, but I do like this whole notion: the mustache handlebars. Now, once you have a vehicle, you've got to have accessories, and it seems amazing to me. Here we have a, a camera that you can mount. Um, there's also a platform that you can buy that you can put a basket on top. And I'm like, really? That would be something you want to do? And then I love this. This is from a German public publication showing all the gymnastical possibilities of the, of the high wheel bicycle. But unfortunately, taking a header was often the end result of riding the high wheel bicycle. And here we have a mass conflagration of, of uh, five guys who are out on a bicycle ride uh, in the southern part of England and one went down and then they all went down. So kind of a scary. Now in 1880, using American ingenuity, seeing how dangerous the motor vehicle was. So Mr. Smith said, hey, what if we switch it around? We'll put the small wheel on the front and the possibility of you going over the top is going to be lessened greatly. Um, what he hadn't counted on though was the number of people that were kind of recoiling and then the people were falling backwards instead. But anyways, supposedly a, a big leap forward in becoming safer. So now if women want to try, they either had to transgress the dress code and thus the ethical code, if those legs were not proper and trousers were inappropriate, or they could opt out for women's bicycles. Women were obliged to ride side saddle. Believe it or not, this lady here is riding side saddle and we have one long pedal that she can go ahead and pedal with. Well, that sounds that seems attractive too. Now the other two pictures. This is a very famous uh, German woman. These two folks are entertainers, and there seem to be a lot of a leeway in uh, in uh, entertaining what kind of clothes you wear. And that was a little bit okay, but uh, it was happening. But for the everyday woman, eh, that's going to be real iffy. So. So here are some of the accommodations that we were making for ladies in our time period. Believe it or not, the majority of ladies did not want to give up their proper formal dress and jump onto a bicycle. They wanted to keep the style of clothing they have because the radical dress was just too radical. So here we have a, um, a, a steering mechanism that is a pole instead, and so you power it like this. So that would be a ladies vehicle. Here we have a, a, a 
a tandem bike that, um, now the question becomes whether you're riding a tandem, is the lady in front or the man in front? Well, the, the man should be in the back because he's the one that supplies the power, but the one in the front is the one that gets to steer. So what are you gonna do? I don't know, there was lots of back and forth on that as well. So by 1870s, oh, um, these side-by-side -side bicycles are called sociables because you can, you can be sociable with each other. Um, you, they also have a new occupation that never existed before. Uh, we have a paid companion who can go ahead with the lady whenever they're riding through town. Uh, this probably with this uniform on is probably not the husband, <coughs> is most likely a paid companion. So we don't want those girls to still go out on their own. Uh, we also have a, a bit of a tandem creation here with, with two ladies front and back. Now, the same gentleman that created the aerial bike <coughs> creates the Coventry Rotary Bicycle. Uh, this was to be something that men and women could ride at the same time, which was very, very, very important for him. Uh, hard metal wheels, uh, the speed was just a little bit slow. The one challenge was though, you had to be a little bit careful whenever you went cornering. Um, if you're gonna turn to the, to the left, you've got to navigate both smaller wheels as well as the larger wheel. So that makes it a little bit challenging, but don't worry, we've got a solution. Here we have the Coventry convertible. Well, you can get the heavy second half of the piece and all of a sudden you now have a companion bicycle and so everything is stable again. So uh, here's another, another version of that as well. Again, which, uh, which seat do you think the lady is going to be going to be riding on the right or the left yep, that one right there that's the, that's the lady's seat that's the gentleman's seat of course Coventry becomes one of the largest bicycle makers in in Great Britain but it's amazing uh, the number of, of shops that, that grew up the industry really 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 exploded here in the United States Pope kept pretty much monopoly the, the Columbia Bicycle Company there are some that start building, but Pompeo is the main one that's still. A couple of more examples of ladies' tricycles. Um, 85, 86, a companion. Again, another companion. Here we have a sociable. And then I thought this was just amazing. Look at that. An exercise bicycle, an indoor bike. Sounds great, huh? Now, believe it or not, while out of her carriage one day at Osborne, Queen Victoria spotted the lady on a trike at a distance. Intrigued, she ordered the driver to speed up. The trike rider looked about and realized who the pursuer was, panicked, and took off. Sadly, the queen did not succumb to the temptation to give chase. Instead, she asked to meet the trike's inventor. Starley was pleased enough to order the trike, and two, although she didn't ride it herself, she invited a surrogate to ride her bicycle, and she would sit in the window and watch her bicycle being ridden. I don't understand that, but that was, that was the queen. So, when you heard of her slides and bike shows where they would charge 50 cents, though. So, there you go. <laughs> 1890 to 1904 is the third craze. Um, and that all comes about because of this particular bicycle, the safety bicycle. And it looks pretty much similar to what our bicycles do today. Um, the main change is we now have chain drive on the back, which means you don't have to have the humongous wheel in the front to give you the power and to give you the speed. It's still pricey, $135, but it's gonna give you a lot more power to go. It was called the Rover because uh, Mr. Starley believed that you could go anywhere with it throughout the, the hills of Scotland and, and places like that. And so that is what we are, are selling it as. So um, eventually they do develop a, a free wheel on the back and so you can actually coast and you don't have to keep pedaling and keep pedaling and keep pedaling. But there you go. Now, wouldn't you know, as soon as we introduce a new bicycle with a step-through frame that women can use, oh dear, 
what are we going to do? What are these women going to do? And I love this. So, <laughs> so we still have the problem of clothing. We've now made accommodations. You can still ride, ride with the clothing that you wear, but the more you're going to ride, the more it's going to be more troublesome. So we have some innovation. Two ladies had some very, very innovative idea. Here we have a cycle in the skirt. You can button up your, the bottom of your skirt. And so you can be uh, riding safely. And then whenever you get to where you're going, you can <coughs> drop the buttons and there you go. There's one problem with that though. There was a lady, in, a teacher in Rhode Island who rode her bicycle to work as such. And whenever she got into the classroom, she was too busy and she did not lower her dress down. And she actually got fired because she was being indecent in front of her pupils. So, um, a far more sensible idea, I think, is the bifurcated skirt where it's basically a, a slit skirt with pantaloons on either side. That's a, a bad word for it, but I'm not exactly sure how to describe it. So, so there you go. Bloomers, they're coming back, they're coming back. This time, popular opinion is still against you, but Pope Manufacturing decides they are going to support this whole new craze because the more safety bicycles that we sell, the more money that we're going to make. And women are a large untapped audience of people that should be riding. And so there we go. Um, but it's amazing. They use images of women wearing bloomers in their advertising. But this is probably the most amazing PR campaign. Paper dolls for girls. Girls, paper dolls that are wearing bloomers. Oh my goodness. And for five two cent stamps? Wow, that's great. We also start having lots of sheet music in our time period. That's the way you get your your music to other people. And so uh, sheet music popularizing the sport. And I thought this was a little bit strange. Cigar makers had lots and lots of cigar brands and boxes with pictures of women in bloomers on. It doesn't make much sense, but I think Pope <coughs> had some sort of some sort of thing. So anyways, a true revolution has occurred. Pope also was very active, um, introduced mass production. production. Um, he also promoted the Good, Root, Good Roads movement in order to help people um, get better surfaces for riding or cycling. He also opened one of the first um, uh, bicycle clubs in the United States, had over 30,000 members, and this was in, in New England, and uh, had chapters all throughout the United States. And, and so he was very, very active, self-interested, but also very active in getting cycling uh, out into the public mainstream. So here we have it. This is what ladies were, or the, so, the social ladies were afraid of. We've got women in pants, we have women in, in pantaloons, but women have to be very, very careful though. There are still lots of social rules to follow Oh my goodness, whenever I saw this, I couldn't believe it. I just, I just could not believe it. Don't wear a man's cap. Don't faint on the road. We can't show the men that we are not as much as they are. Don't go without a needle, thimble, and thread. Oh, okay. Don't scream if you need a cow. If she sees you first, she will run. Holy cow. Now, wouldn't you, wouldn't you all ladies find this very instructive? <laughs> because, of course, we don't want to become the, the philosophy lady with the cigarette in one hand and the like. So, <laughs> don't shoot your gun, exercise your jaws. And so, what's the future hold? You know, the guy by the name of Henry Ford, he also tinkered with bicycles and he created this quadricycle right here. And by 1908, he's launching the Model T. The craze ended in 1904, whenever Mr. Pope realized that he was losing his, his sales. In one year, his sales dropped 75%, and he kind of read the handwriting on the wall. 
and he actually went to starting to make um, his own uh, automobile as well, as well as some motorcycles as well. So, so there you have it. So, so that is a quick overview. Do you ladies feel empowered and independent now? <laughs> Are you glad you don't live back then? <laughs> Anyways. I hope you found this instructive and, and enjoyable. Um, does anybody have any, any questions that you'd like to offer or, or observations? I'm open to either one as well. Yes. Okay, so my family and I were camping at Oak City Reservoir. Okay. And there was a family next to us. I think they were men. Okay. He was wearing a long dress. And I was pleasantly surprised. To see her riding a bicycle. Uh -huh, uh -huh. She didn't have anything pulled up for her dust of her She was on her long, long dress riding a bicycle. I thought, wow. Yeah. I mean, is that great? Or is it not too smart? I mean, she didn't fall. Yeah, yeah. Well, the safety bike. Um, Safety bicycle helps a lot. If you go into Amish country, you'll see an awful lot of, of women that are riding bicycles in their longer, longer skirts. And that was that was just the way, the way things are. It's a good adaptation. Yeah. So they're kind of profiting from all of the other changes that have happened over time. So, so. thanks. Good observation. Yes, way in the back. Well, uh, I, I thought they were going to the next version. Scooters more because they didn't have a lot of scooters and the weight. Oh, like the, the razors and things like that? Mm -hmm. Something about that way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, they were riding bicycles a lot longer before then. They, I have noticed myself as well that, that there have been a lot more scooters coming as well. So it gives a lot more independence. Don't quite have to look as hard either. So, although going uphill is a bit of a challenge because Scooter, you kind of like the Brazilian, so you gotta make your way up the hill. So, yes. My other question was: Can you talk about bicycles and aviation? Bicycles and aviation. Uh, about the only thing that I can say is the the Wright brothers were bicycle makers before then. Is there something that you wanted to focus on? I. Just that. Okay. All right. Yeah. 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 So, uh, if it weren't for sewing machine manufacturers who became bicycle manufacturers and became airplane manufacturers. There you go. So. How old is that bicycle? Pardon? How old is that bicycle? Oh, this is a reproduction. Oh. We've, we've had it since I've been here. And the, the funny thing is that um, for a long, it's, it uh, used to have a name plate on it called the Bone Shaker. And so whenever I would interpret to people, I would say, well, this is our Bone Shaker. And I, and I did have a bicycle expert one time look at me and say, that's not a bone shaker. I'm kind of like, so I did a little research after that. So always, always pay attention to your guests because you can learn a lot. So, um, yeah, um, I'm about five, five ten, five eleven, and if you saw the the numbers for the Coventry, five, five, six foot was about the average height of the bicycle bicycle wheel. So look at how much smaller that is. I mean, I can. I can handle that pretty good. But if you think about something this tall, oh, somebody was asking how, how you get on it. Hang on just a sec. So, fortunately, they developed a peg that you keep on the, on the back, and you basically just pop along. And as you get enough velocity going, you can step onto that peg on the seat and away you go. Now I've seen some pictures and there was a video that I was going to use and didn't. But with those tall bikes, I mean they're showing guys holding on this high and then stepping and climbing up. I don't know. For me the, the stretch from here to here I think would be a little bit challenging. <laughs> but anyways they were quite a full of accomplishment. So, my mother was very excited. Oftentimes, she would start to go to a, a stump or a, a porch or something like that. And so, she could go very far. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's amazing because what helps you stay upright is the momentum you have going. 
And uh, so if you're a lady that's starting out and is riding the side saddle, somehow, I mean, you have to really be counting on that big first push to really give you enough momentum to keep it going. I, to me, that, that side saddle. Yeah, I would think so as well. I don't know how practical that device was, but you've got to respond to your audience. So, anyways, any other questions or observations? Yes. Does the museum have any introductions or actual findings that you can see that you can does the museum have reproductions of any other varieties? Actually, no. Um, those reproductions are very expensive, largely because they're hand built and handmade. Um, years and years ago, I investigated the idea, and for a bronze shaker reproduction, they were asking like three to three to six thousand. And it's kind of like oh, I got to justify that in my budget, and I couldn't see us using it all the time to make it be worthwhile. So, no. But good, thanks for asking. Any other question? Yes. Up there, the, 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 I found it, the bike is going to say it's 135. What would that be for that? Well, it's, money's a terrible thing to talk about because in our time period, there are less consumer goods. And so your money was actually worth a lot more, so to speak. But generally, the, the, the price calculator that I usually go with is about $78 for a dollar in our time period. And so, yeah, you're talking about maybe a $2,000 machine. Yeah, so that gives you an idea that not everybody's going to be able to, to afford those. So. Yes? A lot of labor back then only made about 50 cents a day. Yeah. Get back. Right, right, right. Yeah, depending on the trade and the like. Uh, we generally use an average of a dollar of a dollar just because uh, people like blacksmiths are gonna have about 350 ditch diggers are gonna get 50, and so that's kind of the, the happy medium that we've used. The industry, museum industries is used for quite a while, but you're quite right. Yeah, a lot of people are getting a lot less than that. So yeah. okay. Yes. Well, bicycle and bicycles before that, to me, they look more like bones, almost, when they were sitting side by side. Uh-huh. 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 But they were still called bicycles. Uh, velocipedes. Well, velocipedes, as long as you're powering the front wheel and it's not chain driven, that's kind of the dividing line. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you're right. Velocipedes, bicycles, uh, and it, the terminology is not terribly well used by everyone. So, yes, that's my confusion as well. <laughs> bicycles were initially called wheels. Yeah, very good. Very good. Wheels. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, well, any other comments or questions? Okay. All right. Looks like we're going to get you out of here in time for some evening activity. Uh, the 27th of February, we have Prohibition in Kansas. Come learn about uh, alcohol. Are you going to serve alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> Fire is still up. Okay. <laughs> BYOB, I don't know. So. Thanks a lot for coming out. Enjoy your Yes. How are you?